Mm-hmm. Right. So just to wrap up what we found last night, to, uh, 2006, in your view, was um, certainly an average uh, or uh, a, a, a good expression of Kunawara as a vintage. 2013 and 14, 13 was wetter than 14. Do I have that right? Or is it the other way around? Let me just check one. Yeah, other way, other way around. Um, Four, 14 was wetter. Yeah. Yes, that's right. 13 was a warmer vintage, a shorter vintage, and, right. and then 14 was a longer, slower ripening period. So right. Um, that's how how the vintages went. Uh, very similar from the Shiraz to the Cabernet. When you look at how we produced and what we picked and the reasons why we picked. Okay. Um, Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, you know, it's a pretty bulletproof variety at the best of time. Nice thick skin, so it can handle um, some of the cooler nights and you can let it hang out a little bit longer if you need to. Yep. So uh, it's always a good thing. Um, yeah, so there was, no, there was nothing, in terms of uh, vintage on vintage, the Shiraz and the Cabernet, that, uh, the two varietals performed and had, had, the, the, had identical requirements in those vintages. There was nothing um, you had to do more or less for, for either of the two styles. They, they do from a stylistic point of view. Obviously, we were looking at picking Cabernet. You want to get physiological ripeness with Cabernet. If you pick Cabernet too green, you might have um, the potential for a reasonable alcohol, but right. you don't get physiological ripeness. So you can actually get some green flavours. You get green yep. tannins. Mm-hmm. So you have to be a little bit careful with that. So when you have a warmer year, the potential for higher alcohol is going to be greater without getting physiological ripeness. So you have to be very careful when you pick that. So uh, when you're looking at um, probably 13 versus 14, which are the, probably they're the best two examples because you know one vintage uh, straight after the other, so you can see the differences there from picking. But mm-hmm. with the potential um, and what we're looking for is to get rid of those green flavours without having too high alcohols. Right. So okay. and that would go all the way through the three vintages of so the 06, okay. 13, and, and 14. All right. Um, my memory last night, the thing that really grabbed, well, the two things about the 06 that really grabbed me. The first thing was how classic it was in terms of the flavor profile or the phenolics of the 06. Um, yes. And it also, over the hour that we tasted it, um, it evolved phenomenally well in the glass. I mean, so it, in actual fact, it had been open by that stage for three hours. And it's, mm. it definitely is a lesson learned today uh, I opened my, I, I'd argon sealed these yesterday and opened them um, at three o'clock and just left them. So I'm hoping to get even more of an expression of that, that secondary kind of um, gathering of flavor and phenolics mm-hmm. that we had last night. Um, so I'm going to dive into the six. Mm-hmm. My only regret was I didn't have much left at the end of the night because we stayed on a little while after you. After you left oh, us. Oh, right. Okay. And enjoyed them. Good on yeah, there, there were a couple of people online who were determined to, to flatten the, all the promises about keeping the bottles till the next day <laughs> were lost. <laughs> oh, no, no, I, I can appreciate that. Like, when you look at those older wines, you've really got to enjoy them. As you said, they do evolve. Yep. Um, and the 06 is one of those wines where you open it up. As you said, you open it up three hours later, you're drinking it. And every time you... The, the wine warms up in the glass. It will give off more flavours and stuff. Yeah. Really, my, my, my impression. My impression of the six is that it's quite different manifesting at this stage compared to the Shiraz last night. Mm-hmm. Whereas the Shiraz last night was kind of nervy and 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 kind of agitated in the beginning. It settled out. This is already settled. This has kind mm-hmm. of got its elbows out. The mid palate's already quite expressive. A little mm-hmm. bit of green. No, I guess. Talking about greenness, I'm now looking for it. <laughs> It'll probably, you know, I'll probably forget about it in a minute and won't find it again. Uh, but the, for me, for me in the in, in the mid to back palette, there is a little bit of greenness, not not uh, unripeness, but a component of the flavour being green what, as in veg- vegetable. That? Yeah, I can see, and the vegetal type greenness that, that's herbal notes. Um, there are different styles. Star- styles of Cabernet coming from different parts of Kunawara and certainly yep. this where we are situated in Kunawara we're on the eastern side of Kunawara and yep. we do get a lot of those sort of aromatics and that those aromatics will range in a cooler year um, we'll sort of get uh, leafy aromas so we'll go from leaf 
uh, meat eucalyptus characters. Then you get right. sort of green fruits, black fruits, mm -hmm. um, depending on how ripe they are. And later on, we may, wait, uh, there will be some that you'll see later on in the next uh -huh. couple of wines. So you'll see those okay. different flavours. But certainly, and, to, and there are Tom's Robert. Um, when I notice a little bit of almost capsicum flavour. Yes, yes, that's um, kind of where I was heading. Was which, that, which mm. to me is, you know, it's just that flavour. It's not unripeness. It's not no. that green beanie no, yeah. character that we used to get way, way back when people overcropped and did some funny things. Mm. Um, and I think it's a bit of a characteristic of of Kunawara fruit in a way. It shows that ripeness. Um, really good berry ripeness, and yet you've just got that little edge into it. And um, it, I, I, mean, I find it quite attractive when it's there. Yeah, Lou and I often talk about looking for, um, in Cabernet, out of McLaren, a kind of tomato leaf character, a green yep. tomato leaf kind of component, mm -hmm. which is definitely different from what I found in, in the Kunawara experience, that's for sure. And, and I, the, other, the other thing that my memory bank keeps kicking in is the younger uh, Magella Cabernets show that more prevalently. And probably, as Bruce said, actually, you mentioned a while ago, it kind of settles down and integrates over, over time. That, that, it's that part of the Kunawara Cabernet profile right. um, that's there. Some years you see it more. I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, people talk about mint eucalypt. Um, menthol and all the others. I mean, it's mm. there. Uh, people express it as, as different characters. Mm. Um, some years it's more of it there. Some years there's less of it there. It's like pepper in Shiraz. We can argue about whether it's white pepper or black pepper. <laughs> and how do you get it? I stupidly said one day we buy it in big bags and empty it in there. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I think for me, when it comes to talking about the black and white pepper thing, I find the higher the altitude, the more prevalent is the white pepper for me. And yes. the, the, the lower and the warmer the altitude, the more I get that, that big, chunky black pepper kind of thing. Yeah. Altitude in Kunawara is measured in centimetres, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking of things like uh, the eagle from Dalwini, which uh, back in the day was a glorious Shiraz. Um, but the, the pepper component was always about white pepper as opposed to um, that yes. sort of big grunty kind of. And then it's interesting because if you uh, taste a lot of the Grenaches in Spain, they give you, um, I don't know if you know the Cambodian pink, pe pink peppercorn. You, I get a lot of that in some of the, the younger Grenaches, especially from places like Priorat and stuff, uh, which I'm, a little obsessed about it. I drink too much of it. If we don't talk about Cabernet, Lou will have drunk all his. Yeah, I know. I'll start getting heckled again. I'm watching. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Lou. So, Bruce, the texture... I went through my microphone off because basically most of the time I spend here swearing while Robert's batting on. <laughs> um, I, I mute my microphone. In the so. night. Away, no oh, happy, happy sweet 16, by the way, Lou. You don't look a day over 17. <laughs> and this is the reason I keep the microphone on. Right? And by the way, Lou, yeah. Lou met Bruce, whom you haven't met. Bruce is uh, the magic man behind Magella. I'm just uh, the front man. And uh, this is the first time that Bruce has chatted. Well, with, last night was the first time Bruce has chatted to Robert and the others in Singapore. And well, if you, I'll, if you I'll, want I'll to... Blame Magella for anything, you blame Bruce. Right. No, I was, I was watching intently last night. I was just hiding because I didn't want to show my sweet 16. <laughs> uh, as my daughter's just put it, you might as well hold on to it, Dad, and make it 61 for you. Yeah. <laughs> just won't be long. I, I thought... I thought it was 91 of the, and the 60. I won't make it that far, mate. <laughs> it's too much of your wine. I'm not, I'm not something magic in this, in this bloody cabinet. I'm not going to make it that far. <laughs> oh, anyway, sorry. Continue. Yeah. I'm going to hide behind my microphone. No problem. <laughs> so, Bruce, um, with, with maybe now um, a further half an hour or so in the glass, um, I'm loving the texture. And that classic uh, Magella um, brown spice component is coming up more and more and more over time. And I'm, I'm, I promise myself not to drink any more of it until the end, because I have no doubt that it's going to, it's going to evolve even better. 
it certainly will involve, it'll evolve in the glass, there's no question yeah. about it. Um, so not, look, I agree with your comments. I think it's got a great length. Um, mm -hmm. It has um, some beautiful texture. There's some nice development there and there's some layers of flavour, although even on the palate, mm. um, I'm really impressed with, with that wine. I think it's still got a long way to go. Um, yep. Knowing it, it's still, as older wines go, as I'm sure you're well aware, you look at Shiraz and Cabernet after 10 or 15 years time, they've, they've all got the same tertiary flavours. They're very yes. hard to tell whether they're Cabernet or Shiraz. Yes. Because I can still see this and say this is definitely, definitely Cabernet. Cabernet. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, and therefore it, that's, that's a good backbone for some more ageing. Yeah. I mean, on your original seller notes, this year would be the final year of your recommended window. So it's quite interesting to look at it now and be really confident of a good few more years before it even hits its cruising altitude, in my view. It is um, great primary freshness there still. I think that just de depicts how conservative we really are when you look at the... Got to be. That we've given up. Yep. Yeah. yeah. yeah Obviously, so. how the wines have, have sellered in their first five years of life is going to determine a lot what happens yep. in the next 15. Yeah. So, uh, but no, it's got a long way to go. It really has. I mean, and some Robert, people like primary flavours. So. If Robert's going to read everything, Bruce, we might have to leave that that uh, little um, a tasting um, uh, expectation off. <laughs> yeah, I'll promise not to do any more homework. I won't, I won't, I won't show up. Yeah. So um, let's, let's uh, cruise towards the 13, um, which I'm really excited to see because my memories of last night was... The, the youthfulness and the vigor of the Shiraz, um, up for me, was uh, eclipsed the 14 marginally. Um, and I'm super keen to see if it happens the same way uh, for 13 and 14. If you reference Halliday, he's as excited about 13 as he was about your 14 Cabernet. Um, he recognized completely different components in them, but he expressed... Um, uh, specific, uh, he liked them for different reasons. So maybe we have a look at that, Nancy. Oh, look, I, I think um, what you said, I, I'm, I'm drinking the 13 at the moment. So oh. um, I, I think it's a, a, a lovely wine. It is showing some um, great complexity. There is certainly a lot of, you know, we talk of black fruits. Um, yep. I see a lot of those black fruits there. It's certainly a brewing wine. Um, it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. There's um, maybe lines. more maybe more intense perfume than the 14 right now. Yes. Um, just slightly more kind of you know, looking for attention than the 14 for the moment anyway. Yeah, I th again, we're, we're looking at a wine now that's it's got some age to it. And as we said last night, there is a turning point between the two wines. Yeah. Um, this to me is... A wine that's evolving now, you can still see it. It's very varietal. Um, there's yeah. no question about that to me. That it, it's it's got a beautiful texture to it. Um, it's got some nice nice palette structure. That the colour is a beautiful deep colour. Amazing, um, yeah. It really is. So it's a quite a useful wine. Again, the screw caps are, are a great thing for for a wine that does for a country that has no tradition. We've done well with our screw caps. Exactly yeah. right. There was there was a question from. Um, the peanut gallery about when was your first year under Stelvin? Uh, we did a oh, trial, 2001, we, we did the first commercial trial, and okay. then we did our first commercial release in 2004, where we did 50% cork and 50% under screw cap. What, so would be amazing would, what would be amazing would be to look at those bottlings side by side. Have you ever done that as a, as a yes, I have. experiment? Yes. And what are your yes. findings? Um, certainly, the, there's more development in the uh, cork, um, right. and pretty much everything you'd expect. Right. Um, it, it retains the primary fruit flavour a lot longer. Right. Um, and if you really, if you want your old wine to look young, or do you want your young wine to look old, will determine whether you want a cork or screw yep. cap. Yeah. Um, right. And I think obviously you don't have any cork taint issues, so there's no mm. outside interference. Um, through some contamination through cork. So, but yeah, that was the first year, getting back to the original part of the question. There are a few of the 2001s that I have seen around. Uh, so people do have them, but we only did a small, small, small batch. Yeah. 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 And then so again, they're increasing. In, in my palate, and please tell me I'm talking nonsense if I'm wrong about this, but it seems to me that 
Um, there's more development in the back palate than the front palate of the 13. That the, the, I get this youthful kind of tannic presence in the, in, 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 in the entry of the wine, but the back appears to be a bit more resolved, resolved and integrated at this stage. I think that's just a function of where it's at in its cycle, right? Um, I think you're right there, yes. Yeah, look, it's got a beautiful texture. I, there is mm. some complexity, um, yep. no question about it. It's, it's still very laid. Um, it just, it, it will evolve a lot more. I, I yeah. really agree. Yeah. I've got this yeah. feeling that it's just starting to unfurl. Mm -hmm. I get, yeah, we're looking at it at a really interesting stage where, you know, give it another six to 12 months, it'll be so much further down the track. And six mm. to 12 months ago, it wouldn't be manifesting nearly as interestingly as it is now. I mean, for me, the phenolics between 13 and 14, 13's far more fresh and forward on the nose. Uh, I haven't tasted 14 yet. If it, if it tracks last night, it'd be the similar thing where it's just a little bit tighter now and just needs that mm. that fraction more time to uh, to open up. Yes. Yeah. No. That's that's uh, very true. Very true. I, I agree. It's, as I said, 13 is a beautiful wine to drink. I think amazing. It's lovely. Robert. It's lovely. Yeah, Prof. Yeah. I know. Oh, Kunto. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good evening to everybody. We're a smaller group now. Was it be, would it be okay if I ask? Uh, Just jump in, mate. No, for sure. Um, Bruce, I'm also having the 13 right now, and I have this sort of chalky sort of mouth. Um, yeah, it's that tannic thing that I was picking up. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't get that in the, um, in the 14. Um, any comments? Um, yeah, that certainly when you're looking at that's a tannin, so you're getting that chalkiness, so it'll be mid to back palate. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on where it is, if it's at the very back of the palate, it tends to come from the grape or the grape seed. If it's the middle of the palate, it'll tend to come from the oak. The oak tannin is a bit softer. Um, and if you, uh, and getting back to you saying you see that in that one, I'm, I'm comfortable that people see it because it does help give complexity and give texture. Um, Whereas the, if we're looking at the pair of the 13 and 14, um, I think the 14, that has that's got some fruit flavours. The oak component, as if you didn't see last night, but the oak we're using, this is the same oak. It's 100% French oak and mm -hmm. it's 50% new wood and 25% second use and 25% third use. But it's 100% it's French oak in all three of the wines, the 06, the 13 and the 14. So they're essentially getting the same oak treatment for the same amount of time. So then it comes back down, what you're seeing on the mid palate, there, there's probably of the 14 is going through a, a dip in its life cycle. Some wines, they go through peaks and troughs. Mm -hmm. So they'll go through a little bit of a dip and therefore the, the middle palate will look a little bit different as the wine ages. Again, yeah. there's only 12 months in it, but if it just goes through that, that subtle dip, uh, in the wine's ageing potential, then you, that's probably what you could be saying. I, I actually think that um, overall there's much less tannic present manifest in 14 right now. And with the mm. total acknowledgement that these are living organisms and they're going to change every, you know, every yeah. time you taste them. But um, there's certainly a sense of a kind of roundness and uh, uh, less kind of layering in 14 as compared to 13. And that kind of tracks what we were finding last night as well. Uh, in the, I mean, the, in the, shiraz, the 13 was sort of marvelous. I actually had some um, earlier on before starting uh, the tasting. Tonight, tonight. Yeah. And it's actually very different, yeah. very, very different from what I remember from last night. Um, yeah. And there were two of us last night. I'm myself tonight. But it, the 13 to me was, and I'm loving the 13 right now for uh, the cap. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well done, oh, good. and and uh, just lovely. It's really, really nice. Maybe when you when, when, when I think about the fruit in the thirteen, I'm thinking about things like briar and mulberries and nettles. Mm. There's a, there's a kind of evocative wildness about the thirteen, whereas the fourteen for me is more about ribena, cassis, maybe even towards the cranberry spectrum, just where I am tonight. Uh, so mm -hmm. again, the findings are. Uh, it's interesting how sensational wines, but completely different personalities. Uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see that. Mm. And Bruce, so what, can you remember the harvest uh, time periods? Were they roughly the same, roughly the same time of the year? 
Uh, yes, roughly. Our vintage um, for Cabernet, it, will ge it generally starts in early um, April. So mm -hmm. give or take a week for, for these two. Yeah. Um, it'll be the first or second week of April we'd start harvesting uh, a Cabernet Sauvignon. And um, it's, it's really two weeks would only be um, the variation between those two vintages. Yeah. And I, so, I recall you saying last night that plenty of rain in winter in the 13, but mm -hmm. optimal um, ripening pre-harvest. So it got cool at yes. night, uh, warm during the day, but not too warm, um, which is kind of the, the winemaker's wet dream, I suppose, in terms yes. of perfect, perfect season. Yes, that's right. No, we did. It was a, um, a reasonably quick vintage, so slightly warmer, hence... Um, the 14 was a long, cool ripening period, so yep. they'll get different flavours. And you're talking of the sort of Ribena or um, yeah. uh, red fruits, um, and I think that that's a very fair comment of the 14. Um, the 13, we said, is slightly bigger, slightly fuller. I couldn't find, I did um, say last night, I was going to look to see what extraction rates, and I couldn't find yeah. our record. We've got a computer oh, that's program, a yeah. but it only, only goes so far back, and it was a cutoff <laughs> point, and I couldn't find it. <laughs> so we have basically five years of history. Then you've got to go into the ancient into archives. The archives and, and, yes. I didn't have enough time to do that. But I was looking <laughs> for that very thing this morning because, again, this shows the same pattern as did with the Shiraz last night, that we're getting more tannin structure yep. um, in the 13s and, and then the 14. And I, I, I wonder whether it is because it's a lower uh, juice to skin ratio. Uh, ratio. Yeah. Yep. Um, yes. you, you remember, Robert? Yep. Uh, it's the, I mean, most of you haven't had been fortunate or unfortunate enough, take your choice, to spend some time in Kunawara around vintage. Uh, one of the things you find when you're living there is that you know, we are in a very secure area. We don't get the highs and lows that I read about from mm. um, the, working in uh, other parts of the world. Yep. I mean, we are fairly consistent in cricketing terms, we're there or thereabouts most of the time. Yeah. We're talking fairly fine. A few days difference, uh, about perhaps less you know, less than a week from here most of the time. Yeah. And um, with the exception of the fact that if we get rain, that's that's the big the big yeah. factor. Other than that, yeah. Bruce, it's all it's all sort of fairly similar, isn't it? You know, we can we can plan yes. it ahead. And, um, you know, we've had a few vintages lately where we could set up a vintage plan before we started and it just works all the way through. Yes. We're, we're very, it's, it's, it's one of the easiest places in the world to grow grapes um, because great guys happen to like growing there. Yeah. And um, you know, it's interesting talking about that, that if you find, look at the, gr the grape areas of the world uh, and you'll find that, that actually grape vines like living there. Like yeah, the, 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 the RPs will agree with you. Are um, good. You don't have to force things. Yeah, the RPs will tell you that Stellenbosch and Franschhoek enjoy, that, admittedly, they're closer to the sea, probably. Franschhoek virtually on, is on the ocean, a uh, bit like the Margaret River scenario, but Stellenbosch might be uh, 10 kilometers inland. Um, and they always attribute the stability year in and year out. Um, uh, and consistency of vintage to that. It's exactly what you said now, that this proximity to the ocean and not too close, but uh, the influence of the ocean and uh, it has a, barring the influence of rain, which is a real problem. Uh, it, certainly in the Cape, it rains like crazy in winter. Um, and then they pray for, for very little rain uh, in spring and summer. That's yeah. kind of what if, you, hope if you're growing, trying to grow grapes in an area we are having to put on 15 or 16 fungicide sprays a year. Yeah. Um, we are having to heavily fertilise, although you shouldn't have to do that. But, um, or, or go the other way and, uh, you know, um, really decimate your canopy to be able to get enough sunlight in to ripen. Into the grape, yeah. yeah. You've probably got to think... Why, why am I doing this? I mean, grapevines will grow anywhere. They will grow in Singapore. I've, grown, I've, I've, I've seen grapevines in Thailand. They pick, they pick them twice yeah. a year. Have you tasted you them, pick them though? Them three times. <laughs> 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 yeah. Grapevines. Yeah. 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 Y
Put no league no tactic and, and <laughs> put it everywhere else. I, I don't want to be too unfair to the Thai product, but um, even the white wines, normally you can't do too much damage. I remember years ago tasting Indian wines and um, the white wines were actually okay, the Indian Shannons and what have you. Um, these days, the reds, I'm told, are improving in leaps and bounds. But um, certainly my experience of Thai wine so far has not been, not been fantastic. But, but you will find, um, if you look at areas where where, where we, we, we think that some of the best wines come from, go back and have a look at, uh, at the growing conditions and you'll find that they're fairly easy to grow. Well, the Brosser is, uh, the Brosser is quite easy to grow. Great, great yeah. guys like the Brosser Valley. They like McLean Vale, they like Margaret River, um, and they like Coonawarra, although we are on the cooler end. Yeah. We're not cold, yeah. but we're on the cooler end. Um, it, You've frozen, bro. Like Bloody Telstra. It's comfortable. <laughs> Bloody Telstra. Oh, yeah. yeah well, well. <laughs> you're, you're disappearing on me. <laughs> I must buy more shares. That's the only company I've ever heard shut you up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing the world a favour, Lou. <laughs> we have a rough crowd tonight. Yeah, it's Friday night. <laughs> At least you're there, couldn't tell, to keep us in order. Mm. Um, maybe I could ask Bruce and, uh, and Prof a good question. Mm. Any, any fundamental differences that you have noticed now after we're talking what now you've uh, had 13 and 14 going on you know eight seven years now and do you notice anything that is fundamentally different between the two because I'm honestly I'm I'm I'm, an, I'm very new at this right and I've just done my WSET level three and I'm enjoying both of them but I do see simple differences for different reasons yeah yeah, yeah. I um, think there's an element of there's like an element of Freshness and exuberance in 13. Sorry, I'm answering the bloody question. Sorry, Bruce, uh, please, over to you. Please, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm getting carried away as usual. <laughs> <laughs> um, as as uh, Robert, you started to, to uh, answer the, the question, which I think is very fair, there are some subtle differences. They, they, they are, there's a similar thread between all three wines, which is what I'm pleased you see some subtle differences, but not too much because they're from the same producer, they're from the same vineyard, it's the same winemaking technique. So there's a lot of similarities by design to make them the same. So it's only mother nature that has made them different of the 13 and 14, which are the two that we're talking about now. And those subtle differences you see, we, we have discussed, there's some more, uh, more of the black fruits in the 14, the 13 has got a more complex palette. There are some subtle differences between the vintages. One was a warmer vintage being the 13, the cooler vintage being the 14, which is a slow ripening period. So that will give you different flavors as well. Um, and the tannin structure will be different as you asked that question earlier. The tannin, why is the tannin structure different? And it's really all those other things that are the same. There will be some differences because of the cool ripening period will give you different um, uh, tannins as the vines mature and the grapes reach physiological maturity. So, um, and that's better that the differences. We've sort of looked at both those two wines and, and sort of discussed tannin structure and fruit structure. And they're probably most of the reasons that I, unless Brian can put in something else that he may have seen that I've oh, missed over, over those years. I think a lot of it's to do with the year. I mean, there's not much difference in the vines. Bruce and I, you both know they're all 50 years old. I mean, yeah. There's not much between a 49 year old vine and a 50 year old vine. They're, they're pretty much old and crusty, like, uh, like Lou and Bill. Yes. That's um, right, yeah. <laughs> but uh, certainly, I mean, there are, there are variations in the year. I mean, and I've got to say, look, we're splitting hairs. I mean, yeah. we're having a lot of fun delving down into the minutest differences. I mean, the big thing is that I noticed with them when I looked at them before, I'm in Adelaide now and I don't have them with me. Mm -hmm. is that they have that same stamp. They've got the Bruce Gregory um, Jella stamp. They're, they're balanced, yeah. they're beautifully balanced wines. And I think that's a, that's, a, that's a factor that we don't often talk about is, you know, are these wines all balanced? And they are. 
And the other well, factor we don't talk about, although we're going around and around in circles, is what I what I sometimes call the D factor. Mm. Uh, and we harp on it last night: drinkability. Yeah. Would you have another glass? W would you buy another bottle? Would you would you would you would you go to Wine Exchange Asia and try and get another dozen of them or half a dozen of them? Um, there are lots of wines around the world that don't pass that test. To me, that don't I, have that D factor. I know that talk. I know that talking to Vanya Cullen last week, the one thing that came out of talking with her was, it's got to be harmonious. Like everything yeah. needs to talk to each other, not too much interference. You know those kind of things. And admittedly, she's at the far left spectrum of biodynamics and organics and what have you. But I think that same principle comes all the way through in winemaking, no matter what your philosophy is with regards. And I, I, I'd say, and Bruce would agree, we, we wouldn't put ourselves in the, in the category of natural winemakers, what, we, what people now call natural winemakers, but in a way they are. We run a very simple viticulture program. Uh, we don't do too much to the vines. Uh, we add a little bit of water when we have to. We put on a couple of sprays a year to keep uh, fungicide at bay. We yep. don't, we've never used an insecticide. Uh, the only insecticide we'd ever use would be um, uh, the natural Bacillus thuringiensis, BC, which, BT, which is, uh, um, uh, which is organic mm -hmm. uh, in every stretch. It just happens to kill caterpillars if they're around. And then in the winery, Bruce and Marco don't interfere too much, do you, Bruce? I mean, the wines are... Um, the, no, no, I agree. There's um, really... oh, we, we make sure nothing, nothing bad happens, but we don't, we don't manipulate. Yeah, you're not, you're, not, you're not working a recipe to an end game. You, you're working with the product as it is, and you, you're just yeah, making I mean, the, it all happen. The whole, the whole secret that I like, the thing is we, we try and grow the best grapes we can. And as I've said to Bruce many times, bloody great flavour, just put that in the bottle. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got a couple more questions. Stephen Lyons asked me to ask you, do you see the erosion of the dominance of Cabernet in Australia? Given, I know the prof, you you don't subscribe to the notion that climate change is going to affect varietals. We spoke about that the last time we were together. But do you think, though, that for right or wrong reasons, Shiraz may may survive the climate of Australia longer than Cabernet or better than Cabernet? Oh, personally, no. No, but as a whole, not not talking about Kunawara, which might no, be. No, no. I, I think I think what's happening is all of a sudden there is a. Um, uh, we're in a fashion industry, Robert. Uh, yeah. You know, a, a while ago you couldn't sell Shiraz. Mm. Shiraz went way out of fashion. It was trying to mm. sell Riesling when. Uh, well, when do you remember? Had... Do you remember ten years ago when someone talked about uh, single varietal Grenaches? There was one bloke in all of Australia who was producing a single variety or two. It was Charlie Melton and Roman in Clarendon Hills. There was nobody else. So we have, the, we have a leaning back towards Shiraz. Yeah. The people are still growing plenty of Cabernet. Yeah. And um, Cabernet, oh, look, Cabernet is a far easier grape to grow than Shiraz to get ripe. Shiraz, you have to, you have to work a little bit at Shiraz to get it ripe. Shiraz really? reacts. Shiraz, I, I think if, if climate change is real, Mm. And I don't subscribe to that. You and I both know that. Mm. Um, Shiraz reacts far quicker to inputs or lack of inputs than really? most other varieties, which is why if people are doing research, particularly irrigation research, irrigation right. monitoring research, you'll always do it with Shiraz because... If it starts to get a bit dry, you'll see it straight you'll away. You'll see the results quicker. Gotcha. Oh, very right. much. Yeah. I mean, Shiraz, you know, if it gets a little bit dry, it loses its leaves very quickly. Right. If it gets a little bit wet, it starts to grow new growth very quickly. Yeah. Whereas Cabernet settles back and says, I couldn't care less what you do to me. I'm still going <laughs> to you. you can miss a watering if you like, or you can yeah. add a little bit. Child. Yeah, she'll be right. I'll, say the same. I'll, 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 keep, I'll keep at it. I'll, I'll absorb whatever you're going to throw at to me. Um, and, and in such, in such way, um, and that's why I've always found to get Shiraz perfect mm. takes more work in the vineyard 
uh, than to get Cabernet perfect. Cabernet right. get perfect anyway. Gotcha. And, and hang, Cabernet hangs on. You know, there are, I've, I was speaking to some grape growers in Mildura years ago yeah. and that suggested that the flavour peak for Shiraz up there was about a day. Yowza. You know, flavour goes up and goes there and starts to go. And then it derogates. You know, the flavour peaks probably seven days. Yeah. But with Cabernet, it's probably 14, 15. Oh. Cabernet gets to a point and just stays there, starts to trickle off the other edge. That's crazy. Um, yeah, they're, they, they're different. But we talk to them as, you know, they're both Vetus vinifera and they grow the, in the same vineyards and the same thing, but they are different beasts. Yeah. And I, I just think, I think everything will survive. I mean, um, We'll be talking in 10 years' time. We'll be talking about the same things we're talking about. Probably. Now. Probably right. <laughs> I just wanted to raise everybody's attention to the fact that Kaza and Rumbo have got one of your GPs in front view there, but they haven't bloody opened it. Where's the nub? Decant it. Get the cork out. I mean, come on. <laughs> if you're going to show off that you've got one of the bottles, just at least take the cork out. Well, the other thing, of course, is... To invite you and I and Bruce around yeah, the help tree. Precisely right. I'm, I'm on the other thing, Robert. Talk to you. Because, because he told me there's only three bottles of wine and there's three of us. And I'm, that's <laughs> a girl needs a backup, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but at least I stayed with the theme. I mean, come on. Sorry. I'll double decant it shortly. <laughs> Thank God for that. <laughs> you got by bringing someone else's wine. Yeah, well done, Robert. I'm with you all the way. Thank you, girls. <laughs> So the other that. <laughs> <laughs> so what else have we got there, Robert? Yeah. Yeah. A serious question, Prof. Yeah. In terms of the, um, we've seen that in McLaren in particular, we've started to experiment with Italian varieties, you know, Sangiovese, Primitivo, etc. Is that something that would ever be contemplated for the Kunawara? Oh, yeah, people have done it. People have, people are, there, there's, there are, there are plenty of, um, other varieties out there. Um, Do they work? We don't even, Lou, sometimes we don't even know about them. Sure. Because uh, you know, they're a larger company. And you know, there, there are, Bruce will go in there, there are a few vineyards in Coonawarra uh, being pulled out at the moment, and they're relatively young vines. Right. And I would suggest that some of them are, um, dare I say, a wine. experimental. Yeah. Um, you know, they've uh, decided that, well, let's plant such and such and see how it goes. That, that sort of limestone profile. I mean, some Sangiovese growers would say that would be perfect for them. Others would say, you know, things like Primitivo, no way. Um, I'm just wondering, because, you know, Coriol's had a bit of success, I guess, in, in McLaren, but I just wonder whether the soil structure would be right around... I think, I think it would be. The, the fact that then you've got... Um, you know, the marketing man in me, Lou, says that, uh, you know, it's all right to make it. Then I've got to go out and sell it. Yeah. Um, and if and it you doesn't... Own, and you only knew once, right, Prof? You can only offer yeah, it, it as a new thing it once. It doesn't sell. We've got to go to the expense of pulling it out. Yeah. Ian Hollick, uh, uh, has, in, in his day before he sold, um, uh, I was talking to Ian today, chatting away, um, had tried a, a few other varieties that with... Limited success. Yeah, I've got to say, uh, Robert and I, you know, we, we spent way too much time in Italy, although <laughs> no time lately. But we found that the Australian varieties or attempts at the Italian varietals come up so short that it's not even funny at the moment. So I'm just wondering, yeah. But, the, but you know, Lou, the one thing I want to raise, though, yeah. Jesus, fine age. You know, a Primitivo needs 10 or 15 years to find itself, you know, grow. And I just wonder how much of the Australian experience of these new varietals from the old world just need a decade left to themselves. With Primitivo, Primitivo is just a, a, a sun soaker, right? I mean, yeah. came from California, yeah, went to Puglia. And mm -hmm. loves it. So in Australia, it'll find a place somewhere where. Well, Dave Honan does a good job in Margaret River, and he's probably the first guy that made a world class uh, Zinfandel. Messina make a pretty handy Primitivo out yep. of that. Yep. Yep. Interesting. Um, interesting. After I finished with you, Robert, last night, I went home mm -hmm. and had a cup of tea, thought yep. seriously about going to bed, yep. um, and uh, got a ding on um, on a. Um, WhatsApp message 
and mm -hmm. it's from a good friend of mine, a guy called Andrea Dacin. Now, I don't know whether you know Andreas. He's a fairly unassuming sort of guy. Mm -hmm. um, now, probably in his early 40s. I met him 10 years ago in Australia. He's introduced me as a, a young winemaker from northern Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike, unlike the Asians who produce a name card at the first opportunity, the Italians do it just as they're leaving. Uh, and so I had a look and said, oh, Dre, you work for Marzi, Marzi Agricola. Oh, said, right. And then I looked underneath and said, hey, my Italian's pretty ordinary, but it said, Andrea del Chin responsibile in logica. I said, are you the chief winemaker at Marzi? He said, see, si. <laughs> I told you. I said, no, you told me you were a young winemaker in Northern Italy. You didn't tell me that you're Marzi's chief winemaker. How many, how many winemakers do you have? He said, I don't know, 10, 14, 15, depending. He's so I got a text much. from him that said, um, I then said, hi, Prof, thinking about you, I'm, I'm in front of the beautiful Magella Park, Magella National Park mm. in Abruzzo. I said, good for you. Are you well and safe? He said, all is good. We presented a new Marzi wine, yeah. a blend of Primitivo and Amarone ah. called Terra Gionte. You wouldn't have seen it because I haven't seen it. They showed it to 200 people in Puglia last night. He said, it was great and the wine looks great. So there's a uh, there's that's a, a primitivo. That's a crazy blend. blend. That's a crazy blend. I mean, that actually yeah. takes some cojones to put two different winemaking styles of and course. two different varietals together. Of it's course, a, and it's a wine that, I mean, the, the problem with calling in to see uh, the Boscaini family at Marzi and having to uh, spend some time with Andreas is you sit on his balcony overlooking Lake Garda and they make you drink 25, 35, and 40 oh, years old. It's a hardship. It's a hardship. Someone's got to live away on some salami and um, yeah. some cheese, you know. And um, hands, hands are waving over there. I can see hands waving in the distance, Robert. The girls Quintal. want to chat. Girls, what's going on? Are you waving at the sailors or do you want some, do you want some attention? Oh, Kuntal's got a question. I'm, I'm, I'm waving to say thank you to uh, Prof and to Bruce and to yeah. Robert for organizing yeah. a wonderful program. I unfortunately have to leave. I have uh, commitments with the wife who yeah. I'm happily married with, but I have to keep going there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, have to, I have to say thank you. Uh, one last comment. Yeah. I think Australian wines are coming of age. Um, and I started my journey of appreciating wines 15 years ago in Australia. And I will tell you something that I think Australia is really going places and uh, Prof, you and Bruce and others around in Australia are doing a fantastic job. And uh, I, I, I wish I was in Australia more because then I could afford a lot more than I can afford <laughs> in Singapore. But you guys do a fabulous job. And... Um, I, I really, I have an Australian, I'm married to an Australian, so I have an Australian palate. Yeah. But <laughs> um, I really think you guys do a fabulous job. One last question, and maybe, uh, maybe you guys could help me steer some conversation to the next question that others might have. I've enjoyed the 2006, but I'm finding it a little bit over the hill. Um, I don't know if you're sensing that. I agree. I find the original thing now annoying. I agree. Okay. You don't think it's because the fruit expression in 13 is so absolutely gun amazing. When you, when you compare it to the six now, no. it's left a little bit behind the... The, 13, the 13 has, has secondary notes, even has tertiary notes. Mm. I don't get the tertiary notes in the, in the, in the 2006 anymore. I, I, mm. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe my... No, no, no. You know, again, wine's a personal thing, but to me, 13, like last night and tonight, yeah. Yeah. Is like way up there. I agree. Uh, I, totally see, agree. I would say 2013, 2006, and then 2014 for tonight. Yeah. But yes. Last night, I had it the other way around. I had it 2006 was singing, you know. She it was, was awesome last night. Awesome. Yes. And, I, and I went the other way. I thought the 2006 sure I looked all right, but I... Loved as a 2006 Cabernet, and that's because Bruce and I are probably used to older, older Cabernet characters because we mm. see a few of them. Mm. And um, 
Uh, we both commented on how nice that wine looks. Sure, it doesn't look as fresh and tasty as the 13 or 14. I like its quietness, it's Prof. I, I, I think I, it's I, aging far more gracefully than you and I, Robert. I oh, definitely, looks, without question. <laughs> I think it looks pretty good. The other thing, of course, is we're just oh, looking at the, the six Cabernet de me screamed, screamed for a hunk of steak or something like that. I would have loved yeah. to have got into mm. it. Yeah. But, Prof, it's a personal preference. You find with these, these older Kunawara Cabernets, I've, God knows I've collected many of them over the years, at around that 12, 15 years of age, they start to get that vegetable character. Now, some people like that, some people yep. don't. I don't think they like it. Um, especially when it's pronounced. And in, in the 06, I just find it, it's on the cusp for me, for my personal preference. But it's a personal preference thing, right? And also, Lou, it's manifesting characteristics because it's being tasted in the lineup with cool. younger, fresher wines, right? I think if you, if you look to that 06 as a, in an isolationist thing, I, I think you, you, maybe you'd have a different... Anyway, like no Ross name, says... No names, no pack drill, but yeah. I can remember winemaker who's not in Kunawara anymore yeah. uh, he owned his own winery at the time he sold it and um, when he was just starting out um, uh, he really poo-hooed old wines when we were looking at old wines and tasting yeah. like that young fresh characters 10 or 15 years later on he really loved the older ones because he had a cellar full of them he had a drink <laughs> and he drank a lot of them and his yeah. palate had adjusted yeah, yeah. Um, uh, to yeah, very much appreciating those characters and Bruce and I, we find we find when we're going around, there are those people who who enjoy what, the more mature wines, and those mm. because they haven't got around to tasting too many of them are like blue and, and like mm. them young and fresh. Oh, yeah. Lou, I used to be like you, but now young I'm, and I'm, fresh. I'm, I'm actually <laughs> Catholic in my taste. If it's down you know, I went to Jeffrey Epstein School of Wine Drinking, I think. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, listen, I know it's getting late for you guys in Adelaide. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so looking forward to the GP versus Redux showdown. We're going to figure that out in August. I'm dying well, to we'll, that. we'll sort that out. Hopefully, yeah. you know, at first opportunity, um, I'll try and get over there, Robert, and we'll do, we'll do something together. And get and, Bruce to come uh, up and visit us. We'll I mean, Bruce geez, to come where's the love? Yeah. And, uh, and they'll get Kuntal along and, uh, and a few yeah. others. And, um, Bruce, you've got to come and then we'll do a dinner with you. Mm, Any time, great. my friend. I, mean, for sure. um, for I don't sure. know whether Kuntal realises, but Singapore, uh, as a, I have a soft spot, it was our first export market. It's still a very strong export market. Um, I've I've been known to land at Changi and look at uh, Roslyn and say, I think I'm home. <laughs> I feel very much at home in uh, in that city, and yeah. and I'm very annoyed that that uh, that we can't get together. But at least a matter of time, Prof. It's a matter of opportunity. Time. Let's it's just, you to go, is it? just a matter of time, but as yeah. as long as you don't bring the security from Melbourne with those. Yeah, yeah. let's let's leave uh, the Victorians uh, out of it, right? Bloody <laughs> Bob, bloody Bob of pirates over there. <laughs> All right, I thank you so much, guys, and it's been a fantastic series. I appreciate your generosity in letting us look at the older wines. It's been well done, incredible. Well done, thank you so um, much. Would you mind sending? those that are here and maybe those that, that were here yesterday. Uh, <laughs> would you mind sending us what's available that we can purchase? Yeah, we've got, we've got three sets left. We might split them up or might not, I haven't figured it out, but we've got three of each left online at the moment of the, of the packs that, that Prof gave us. And, and certainly I'll get together and, you know, if we see a chance where there is, um, you know, even just a small packet of older stuff that, uh, mm that is available. Um, I'll be talking with Robert Kuntal. I mean, um, he's our A grade number one new beaut. Him and Lou contact in Singapore. We've worked together for how many years, Robert? Long I'm time just going to say more than a decade. It's safe. I am here and you're skinny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's more than a couple of decades, but yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, Robert will be, Robert will be the, uh, the go, Robert and Lou will be the go-to people to see uh, what's available and um, you know, keep in contact. Um, and uh, and if any of you, like when, when this all finishes up and you get a chance to come out to Australia,